So uh, we started, uh, I don't really want to call it a series, but for Thursday nights with kind of the, the theme that was set uh, after the Focus on Evangelism conference of the ABCs, I decided to go through some of the simple, uh, I shouldn't say simple, some of the, uh, the kind of basic elementary type things uh, that w somebody needs to learn after they're saved. And uh, maybe I haven't been very clear that that's my intention, but that's just kind of the way that this has gone. So we've looked at different things, what it means to be a Christian and, uh, uh, you know, uh, some, some things along those lines. But tonight what I want to preach on is the Bible itself. So the profi profitability of all Scripture, the profitability of all Scripture. And that's what we see here at the end of this chapter. We're going to take a... A uh, close look at this chapter, kind of like an expository type uh, type look at it. And uh, right away, you know, when I asked Brother uh, Austin to read this, uh, he was remembering the first part of this chapter and not the second part of this chapter. And sometimes I think maybe we wouldn't understand how these fit together. So let's look at that real quickly. <clears throat> at the very beginning, Paul is warning Timothy about perilous times that are going to come. And of course, we've been in perilous times for uh, for a long time here. We know that things are going to just get worse and worse, you know, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to just be all downhill. I think what's happened is, uh, is we've had our ups and downs in society, but I believe that eventually it's going to just hit that really low point, like the really perilous times and that's what we read about with the antichrist and all that kind of stuff but he's saying in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous boasters proud blasphemers blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unholy without natural affection truce breakers false accusers incontinent fierce despisers of those that are good uh, you know, we just had this conversation tonight. Uh, we had about four houses in a row that were the very liberal, like, you know, rejectors of, of God, kind of laughing at us for even being there. Believers, signs outside the door. We believe love is love. And, you know, those the, those things, feminism and all this kind of stuff. And I told, uh, uh, I was talking to Sharice. I said, I said, you know, I, I think about this a lot. Like, you know, they smile when they, and actually, she brought this up. Isn't it weird how they smile when they open the door? Hi, how are you doing? You're like, hey, I'm from Baptist Church. They're like, all of a sudden their face changes. And I'm like, why is that? And so we started having this little conversation, you know, a lot of good conversations while you're out soul winning, going from door to door. And I was saying, like, it is kind of weird because what do they think when they open their door and they see someone standing there? You know, clearly if they knew you were a Christian, they would come to the door with face. So what is it that they think that you're there for? And why is their reaction just naturally friendly until you tell them from, that you're from a church? Like, you know, I was thinking like, uh, you know, if, if we were like, hey, hey, could I borrow five dollars? You know, I, I really need to go buy a beer or something like that. They'd be like, oh, yeah, I understand. You're just out of luck right now. You need some, you know, because they can't they have this friendly demeanor. But when they find out that we're Christian, it's just like, oh, we need to get them out of there. And I said, you know what? They think we're the bad guys. They think that we stand against everything that they believe to be good. And it's funny how many times the Bible says that, that actually these people believe evil is good and good is evil. And so uh, it's interesting. It says despisers of those that are good. Now, obviously, there are none good except the Lord uh, as far as just you know, what defines us. We're not completely good. Nobody's completely good. Uh, but, you know, we are representing goodness. We want to be good and upright and all that kind of stuff. But they see us and they despise that. Okay. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the powers thereof from such turn away. And so he's talking about these people in the, in the perilous, in, in these perilous times, these last days, and he's warning Timothy. So this is, uh, you know, thousands of years ago. And he's telling him that these people have a form of godliness, uh, but they're going to creep into houses. They're going to lead people away from the truth and, and all that. He says, for of this sort are they which creep into houses. And uh, I think that word is interesting. He's talking about creeps here. You know, <laughs> where does that word come from? You creep. Yeah, these are people that creep in unawares. Like you're not expecting them to come, but they just come. And uh, and again, they think 
that good is evil and evil is good. They have a form of godliness. And so this is an interesting thing. I, I, I told her that as well. I said, uh, you know, Christians are somewhat to blame for that, that kind of response, you know, because we have, we have conditioned in a sense, I'm talking about Christianity, the mainstream Christianity has conditioned the world to think that that's what good is, is like, hey, we just need to love the, the bad people and the, and the poor and the drug addicts and all that. And we do need to love them. But, but it's almost like we've told the world like this is, I mean, if you think about it, like our nation's not a Christian nation. Our nation is kind of a humanistic nation. But if you think about it, like the principles of even uh, uh, humanism, they don't know it, but it's some way based on the principles that Christ taught. They just take it to mean what they want it to mean, and they apply it differently. And so, uh, so you know, there's a form of godliness even in the world's, uh, you know, trying to be, you know, trying to tr do what they think is good. It's a form of it's a form of godliness. So, anyway, it's it's interesting, and this has crept into quote unquote churches. You know, this mentality. And this idea that, hey, we need to, you know, I was just talking to a guy the other day and he was talking about a Methodist church he went to that he, he called it himself. He said it was a gay friendly Methodist church. And he was saying that as a good thing. And so what the point was, like, he just said, oh, it's good to have a church that's open minded and they're willing to accept, you know. So this is this is what's going on, even in churches that call themselves Christian churches. And, uh, and this is sneaking into even good Baptist churches. Unfortunately, some of this uh, from some of this uh, principle, and it says that there are ever, uh, let's see here, for they creep in houses, led uh, captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so uh, just to give a little context to the verse, of course, we're heading towards the end where it talks about the Bible because we're talking about the profitability of Scripture. But before he gets to that point in this chapter, he says, I want to just remind you in the last days, these perilous times are come. This is what people are going to be like. They're going to creep in unawares. They're going to uh, lead people away. I know it says silly women, but you know, I'm just going to say people. All right. They're going to lead people away from the truth. Silly women, silly men uh, are going to follow after, uh, after these teachings and such. So here's what he says about that. He then provides this example of Janus and Jambres. And he said, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Now, we don't really know much about Janus and Jambres just based on the Bible because this is the only place we see these names. The only thing we can think of is like trying to find some place in the Bible, like who withstood Moses, who come, be who came and withstood him and uh, and challenged him or confronted him, that was eventually, uh, uh, you know, they were eventually uh, found out to be to be fakes. Okay, because that's what the the uh, context here says. Verse nine says, "But they shall proceed no further." For their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Okay, so where do we see a place where they, you know, they 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 were going up against Moses, and they were found out to be fake? God prevailed, and really, it's hard to find the example of that. So history, you know, kind of. Uh, I don't go off a lot of commentaries. Uh, a, a lot of the commentaries want to turn to sources of like the the rabbis of today and what they their traditions teach and all that. Look, if you look into that, you'll find most of that is just their man-made traditions. Uh, the Obviously, the Jews don't even believe Jesus was the Messiah, so so they're not saved. So how can we understand, how can we expect them to have an understanding of the Old Testament scriptures? And so I usually don't go off of the commentaries and uh, the rabbis and stuff like that. But tradition shows that Janus and Jamres is perhaps, uh, you know, Again, according to their writings, it is, but I'm just going to say perhaps. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. But it's those ma magicians who stood before Moses and Aaron, and when they did the, uh, they brought forth those plagues. You know, God said, throw the 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 the, uh, ser the, uh, uh, the staff down, and it become a serpent, and all that kind of stuff. Let's real quickly go to that and see if this is who Janus and Jambres is. Kind of makes sense. Uh, and we'll look at how they were, how their folly, the folly of these creeps, 
was made manifest and God got the victory over this. Look at Exodus 7. Look at verse 10. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh, I'm sorry if I got here too fast, Exodus chapter 7, verse 11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. And so I started to read that they did also in the like manner with their enchantments. But no, see, Moses and Aaron, they weren't using enchantments. Moses and Aaron were just using the power of, of God, and this serpent and this uh, staff became a serpent. But here, these magicians, they were, it looks to me, like just creating some kind of fake thing. I don't know what they did, how they did it, but they recreated that enough that Pharaoh would say, yeah, see, my magicians can do what you did, so who's God? There is no God. And, uh, and his magicians did that. But then we see in uh, verse 12, For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Now it's interesting, I have uh, seen, like there was this popular, you know, anything Hollywood puts out, you can expect it's going to be wrong, okay? But there was this popular uh, movie called The Prince of Egypt, which I love the soundtrack, by the way, but Prince of Egypt, and it tells the story. And in this story, whenever he, whenever they uh, cast these uh, serpents down, I mean, cast the, the rods down and they become serpent, then it's like all the attention's over here and in the background, in the shadows, you know, Aaron's, Aaron's rod, the serpent swallows those, that, the, the other snake. And it doesn't explain that everybody else could see that. From the text here, it looks to me like everybody saw that. But, but Pharaoh's heart was still hardened. Even though he saw that, he wouldn't receive it. And, and that didn't mean anything to him. And he just carried on because his, his heart was hardened. But, uh, but I guarantee you, though, if the sorcerers, the magicians who did this by their enchantments, and then they watched as their, you know, their fakery got, you know, swallowed up by the real thing. I'm sure that's stuck in their minds, okay? Let's go to chapter 8, verse 18. You're in Exodus chapter 8, verse 18. And the magicians did so. This was uh, whenever they, one of the plagues was to put lice uh, on man and in beast. And the magicians did so with their enchantments, to bring forth lice, at least they tried, right? But they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. For some reason, they couldn't figure out how to recreate that and make it look like uh, that they were uh, turning this uh, into, they were bringing forth this lice upon men. And so now they've, they've, they're, they, they have to admit that they're defeated. Okay. Look at chapter 9, Exodus chapter 9. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes in the uh, furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh, and it shall become small dust in the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it upward, uh, upward toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. Now, it's a, it's a little uh, confusing because it says boil, and you're thinking, well, what, did they just have one boil? You know, I guess maybe their whole body was a boil. <laughs> okay, but I think it's just it's just using that. Sometimes the the tenses in the Bible is kind of confusing, like fish or fishes. Uh, you know, but I think it's just saying kind of like Job. He had boils like all over his body, from his head to his toes. And the magicians, they couldn't even stand up to try to recreate this because they were covered with these boils. What are they gonna do? Recreate? It's funny how they did, like with the frogs, for instance. It's like, uh, man, we're really. You know, I can't believe he brought this plague of frogs. Magicians create more frogs. <laughs> okay, so now they got just extra frogs. What did that help? But uh, but they couldn't get rid of them. They could only kind of produce more, or at least f fake it. You know, where it looked like they were producing the frogs. But here now they have boils. They're completely defeated. They've already found they couldn't do the lice. 
uh, you know, their snake was swallowed up by the other snakes. Now they, they can't even stand up and do it because they're covered in, in these boils. God's people aren't covered in the boils. And, uh, and so they, they have pretty much been defeated. Look at chapter 10 and verse 7. And Pharaoh's servant said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? Now here's the thing that puzzles me the most about this whole story. There's no evidence that they said, you know what, we're going to go with the Israelites because their God is the God, right? Like we see some in some other cases where they embrace the, the Hebrew God. Here we see that these guys are just let them go worship their God. We're, we're defeated. We're, you know, we, we can't do anything else, so let them go. Which means they sat there and saw the truth. They saw who the real God was. They saw the miracles. They saw all that stuff, and they just chose in, you know, to re reject that. You know, or rather, they had already chosen to reject that, so when they see the truth staring them right in the face, they can't even, they can't even accept the, the truth. Now, I want to show you this. Look at 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, and I'll bring this back to uh, 2 Timothy here in a minute. Uh, let's see here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's start in verse 8. This is describing, again, in the last days, perilous times shall come, right? That we read about in 2 Timothy. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness and unri of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of truth that they might be saved. Okay, so we're talking about people who rejected the truth, did not receive salvation. They did not turn to Jesus. They did not accept Jesus. And so they, uh, because of that, you know, they're filled with all these lying wonders and, and all that kind of stuff. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Look at verse 11. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie and, uh, and that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now it's interesting because we see this repeated many times in the Bible. You know, like Pharaoh hardened his heart and then all of a sudden God said, I'm going to harden his heart. And some people have a problem. They struggle with that verse and that concept because they're like, God won't ever reject anybody. How could he harden somebody's heart? He wants them to come to the truth. But the fact is he gave them the chance and they denied it. And so he said, now I'm going to give this strong delusion where they're not even going to believe it, even though the truth is standing them right in the face. Uh, how many people have seen the UN just recently? I, I saw it. I don't know how long it's been there, but just recently I saw pictures of it. The UN put this statue right outside. You can look this up. This isn't a conspiracy theory. And if you look at it, it's got like this leopard's head and the feet like a bear, and it's got these wings, and it's real colorful. It looks almost like rainbow. It's got rainbows on it and all this kind of stuff. And everybody's like, whoa, doesn't that sound like Daniel's prophecy about this beast with the, you know, the the leopard head and the bear's feet? Like, I don't know how much it matches that, you know, that image in Daniel to a T, but everybody thinks about that. Even people that don't believe the Bible, if they have any knowledge of Daniel, they say, hey, like, this looks like the image uh, of Daniel. And I got to thinking about this as people were sharing that on Facebook and they were like, whoa, you know, this is all like prophecy coming fulfilled. And I'm like, yeah, it's self-fulfilled -prophe self prophecy because people are like, oh, yeah, you know how uh, Daniel talks about, I don't know if this happened, but this is what I'm thinking in my head. You know how Daniel talks about this beast and this image and all that stuff? Let's set that right outside the UN and we'll call it the guardian of peace. That's what it's called, something like that, the guardian of peace. Interesting, the Bible says, when they say peace, peace, what's going to happen? <laughs> right? It's really weird. And you say, oh, that can't be true because it's just too obvious. And here's what I got to thinking. Like one day, I've always said, like, do you really think the mark of the beast is a 666? I mean, come on, that's not the exact interpretation of the Bible. But now I'm starting to think people are so brazen. Everybody knows what 666 is supposed to represent. Like people make jokes about it, Satanist, you know, write that on things. 
Now, I'm starting to think like it's going to literally be a 666 across the forehead. <laughs> and people are going to be like, oh, that's not real. It's just, yeah, I know they got that idea from the Bible, but that's not really what it is. Because people are so brazen that they won't even look and see the truth in front of their eyes because they've rejected it. And so a whole world might be receiving this mark and people are just like, yeah, that's not what it means because people don't want to receive that. Now, with that being said, it's interesting how many people can read the Bible. Here's the, what blows my mind. Talk to a Jew. You know, talk to a Jew about the Old Testament and how the Old Testament prophesied so clearly about Jesus Christ. And now when Jesus Christ came, it matched all those. Like, why was all that in the Old Testament? And it's interesting, over the years, like the, the New Testament, there's been a lot of Greek, you know, different Greek texts that people have based their translations off of, uh, and all the modern translations based off different texts than the King James translator based it off of. But you know, there's been hardly any changes in the uh, Old Testament. If you took a Jew, Jewish person, speaks Hebrew, and you said, hey, like, like this is the, the source. This is where the King James translators got what they translated from, you know, from the Old Testament. And you said, does this match your Bible? They would say it's exactly the same. It's the Masoretic text. It's the, it's the, you know, the Hebrew text. That's what it is. And so it's not like somebody like over time, like added in all these pictures of Jesus into the Old Testament. That was there throughout all history. So whenever all these things came fulfilled, when Jesus came, they all prophesied about Jesus, and it's like, it's not a coincidence. But these people will look at all that and be like, no, that's not him. I reject that. And it's just amazing how people can look at the Bible and, not, and, and, and just not believe it, not accept it. But we as Christians understand, well, we're, it's a spiritually discerned, and we've received that. And so now that we've received it, we can look at it with an honest eye and say, well, this is so true. This is so obvious. These things are all going on in our society, just like God said they would. And these things happen just like, uh, just like God said they would. And yet so many people uh, will see those, and they'll see it right before their very eyes, and they'll say, no, nah, you guys are so ridiculous, you and your, 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 your religion. And... That's really interesting. So let's go back to uh, 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> and so he uses this example, okay, of these creeps that are going to come in. He talks about Janus and Jambres, assuming that that is, are the, the magicians or two of the magicians or whatever. We don't really know. Uh, it definitely seems like those people rejected the truth, but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be mani uh, made uh, manifest unto all men. That should, ha that will happen to this, uh, to these other, uh, people that resist God, just like it happened to them. Okay. But here's what he says in verse 10, but thou hast, he's, this is Paul talking to Timothy. Timothy's, uh, uh, what some people would call a preacher boy, you know, he's learning uh, the Bible and how to do the ministry and all that. And so he says, thou hast fully known my doctrine, uh, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecution I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that live Godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and, and hast been assured of, knowing whom thou hast learned them. So he's going and he's saying, like, you've seen all these, you know, you, you know the stories, you know there are going to be perilous times, these creeps are going to come in, and you know all this is going to happen, but you need to follow the men of God who appointed you to, uh, to the Word of God. Now here's an interesting thing. As we're talking about Scripture, uh, you know, and this is something I, I, I know I'm, I'm not taught, I, I told you that the series is kind of like what you would teach somebody after they get saved, but I'm talking to people in here that are more mature, and so I'm speaking to you like people who know, know some of this stuff already, okay? <clears throat> but here's the thing about the Bible. If you really stop and think about it, you might scratch your head and wonder, how did we get 66 books of the Bible? And how do we know for sure that those 66 books are the inspired Word of God? 
You know, and I remember going through this phase. Of course, I had already had faith since the time I got saved that the, this was the Word of God. I had no doubt about that. But in Bible college, funny how many doubts start creeping up because you have to deal with these things. And you're like, I'm going to talk to people about these things and they're going to ask me questions. And so you start considering it yourself. And, and I remember thinking like, what was Paul thinking as he's talking to Timothy? And he says, all scripture is inspired, right? We say, well, well, there's 66 books in the Bible. Yeah, and a lot of those books were written by Paul. And here's Paul telling Timothy, like, all Scripture is inspired. How do we know that Paul's talking about his own words? Okay, so that's a legitimate question people might ask. So let me go through that real quickly and uh, explain just a few things. Are Paul's writings uh, inspired Word of God? Of course, we, we all believe that it is. We know that it is. But somebody might ask that question. Well, first of all, this is the Paul that was talking to Timothy and and Paul, as he started every letter, just about every letter, there's an exception, Philippians, uh, I don't think he does. But all of these other letters, okay, so well, we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then we got Acts, and then we start for a while, we're in all Paul's letters, okay? So let's start with 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians 1. All these will be just chapter 1, verse 1, okay? 1 Corinthians 1, 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Okay, this is the guy that was with him kind of dictating. Uh, he was dictating to him and he was writing it down. Okay, so Paul says, as he writes this letter, he's, like, he's basically saying, I'm writing this to you on the authority of my apostleship. You know, I'm an apostle. I've been given the authority to write this to you. And so, and so basically listen to what, you know, obey what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. It's from God. All right. Now I'll show you that here a, a, a little bit closer in a minute. And I won't take you through all these, but if you go to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> oh, wait, <laughs> I was supposed to start in Romans. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. I started going the wrong way. Uh... Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Okay, so every time he's going to do this, Galatians, same thing. He's talking about his apostleship. Uh, like I said, Philippians doesn't do it. Ephesians, Colossians, and then even 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, right? 2 Timothy starts the same way. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. So as he writes his letters, he's establishing, you know, hey, I'm writing this on the authority of, of God. Basically, God's given me these, these uh, words to tell you. Now, another thing is interesting is in Paul's own writings, if he ever says something that he doesn't feel like, well, this is exactly what God wants me to tell them, he kind of, he kind of gives a warning about that. Okay. And then we see that in 1 Corinthians 7 real clearly. So I don't know if you're already in, if you're still in Corinthians or if you followed along. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7. So look at verse, let's go with verse chapter, I mean, uh, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10. And unto the married, uh, great, I mean, most of the people in here probably know the context of this. I'm not preaching on this subject, so I'm just, I'm just looking for the part where Paul says whether this is of the Lord or this is not of the Lord, okay? And he says, but if uh, she depart, let her remain, un, un, I'm sorry, Verse 10, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So you say, well, this is Paul's writings. Yeah, well, Paul at least was saying, no, no, it's not my writings. This is from the Lord. Okay, but then as you go on, uh, you keep going through this, uh, and he's giving all these different, uh, this is a really good chapter to read, but... Uh, what I want to show you, I'll tell you what, go to verse 40. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So, uh, so he's saying, you know, that I, this is just my word, this is my judgment, but I think that it's inspired by the right thinking, okay? But that's only a little section here because I left out the part which I didn't, I didn't read. I should have just kept reading. Uh, he says, but if the unbelieving part, verse 15, let him depart. Uh, that's not it. Let me see here. 
There's a couple places where he says it, so I'm getting confused here. Uh, is anyone call this? I didn't want to have to read the whole thing. Look at verse 25. Now, concerning vir virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord uh, to be faithful. So he's pointing out again, like, look, this is my judgment. This is not a direct commandment from God, but this is my, uh, my judgment. And then there's other places where he says, um, man, this, where, where does he say that? Like this, this next part, like, isn't my word, isn't God's words, but it's my words. Has anyone seen that part? I should have just read that whole, whole section. Uh, anytime this happens, it's just like, I can't find anything. It just kind of, I freeze up. I know it's the part where he talks about like, uh, uh, you know, not, I'd re it'd be better if you're not married. Why in the world isn't this popping out at me? I know it's there. Verse 12. Ah, that's why not on the right page. Okay. So here we go. So, He's, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, speak I, not the Lord. If any brother have a wife that believe not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So you see how he's being very careful to say like, all right, I'm giving you a direct commandment. This is, I know this is what God's word is. And on these others, he's like, look, I'm not going to say this is necessarily God's word. This is my judgment. And I think I have the Holy Spirit. Okay. So he's being real careful. It's not like he's just trying to take advantage of people and say, hey, this is what I think. He's saying, no, thus saith the Lord. And then the parts where he's not 100% sure, he's like, now this is my opinion, but this is based on, you know, being spirit led to give you these judgments or whatever. Now we know that all scripture is inspired. We're going to get to that here in a second. But at the time he's writing this, he might not 100% sure even know as he's writing to Timothy, like every word that I'm writing is going to be in the canon of scriptures. It's going to be passed down. All he knows is I'm writing this and, and this is something that is God speaking through me to you. Okay. And then he writes that down and he sends it. He even signs it and he puts it in such a way that they know that this is from him and that his, uh, based on his apostleship, they need to, uh, you know, have uh, see it as an authority in their life okay and then we come to the end of the bible we come to first and second peter and go over to second peter if you would and remember peter was given kind of a special position by the lord as a head of uh of the church at that time no he wasn't the pope i'm not saying that but he was you know, at least for a certain time, he was to lead the people in Christ's absence. Uh, obviously, he was present with them in spirit, but in, but he, he had uh, the Apostle Paul to kind of lead them. I mean, I'm sorry, the Apostle Peter to lead them. And so here's Peter's writings. First and second Peter. Here's second Peter chapter three. If you're ever looking for this scripture uh, and you're not sure where it is, if you have second Timothy three sixteen memorized, that'll help you to remember that. 2 Peter 3.16 is, uh, is where you can find this, okay? So 2 Peter 3, what do you read? 15 and 16. <clears throat> An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our, our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as do they also the other scriptures unto their own, dis uh, their own destruction. So Peter, by this point, had already acknowledged that all these letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, some hard to understand, and there are definitely people out there resting them and making them say something they don't say, which, by the way, they're doing that to this day with Paul's writings or in regards to salvation and all that stuff. They're twisting them. And he's saying, like, these are... They're twisting these like they do the other scriptures, which means these are scripture too. Okay, And so Paul's writing here, his authority and everything he's saying to Timothy is also scripture. Now go back to 2 Timothy 3.
So he's telling him, you know, the evil time, these creeps are going to come in. They're going to be teaching all this stuff and they're wicked people and they call good evil and evil good. And then he says, hey, just like Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, but in the end, right, he's like, they didn't prevail. Uh, they were, uh, uh, their, their folly was made manifest. And then he says, but, but you know, uh, fully, you know my doctrine, and you've watched my life, you've seen all that. Of course, we, we have it all written in the book of Acts, and so we get to see that. <clears throat> and then he's like, uh, and then he's like, you know, uh, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Okay, now let's finish this uh, last part. I say finish it. I actually have a lot to cover, but I'm going to try not to uh, go too long. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Notice that he's not saying, you know, these scriptures are going to make you wise unto salvation because they're going to show you the way to live and you're going to live godly. And if you live godly enough, you can go to heaven. Doesn't say that. It's like the scriptures have made you wise unto salvation, which is through Christ Jesus. Which means, what was he talking about? Now, we said his writings were the inspired word of God, but that's not the scripture he's talking about. He's telling Timothy about the scriptures that he probably grew up learning. I don't know how old Timothy was or how long it had been after Christ before he was a child who was learning these things. But do you remember with, uh, look at Luke chapter 24 real quick. Luke 24, and this is after Jesus has risen and he goes kind of like one last time to talk to the disciples. And these are the first disciples that he sees. Luke 24, let's start at verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with uh, his wife, Drusia, which is a Jewess. He's, no, that's not it. Hold on. Uh, Acts. Not Acts. What am I doing? Luke 24, 24. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the woman has said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village uh, uh, whither they went and made as though uh, he would have gone further. So we see that when Christ was talking about himself, he went through all the Old Testament scripture. He went through uh, Moses, which Moses has always been accepted as uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? The Pentateuch. And so, uh, and so he went through that. Then he went through all the prophets. And so he was saying all these things he was preaching about himself. Christ was saying, look, all these Old Testament scriptures prophesied about me. And isn't it interesting, you can go through all the books of the Bible, all the way through the Old Testament, every single book, you can point out, hey, this is talking about Jesus. Genesis, he's all over, right? The different, uh, you know, the, the coat, uh, you know, that was, that was made for Adam and Eve after they sinned from an animal, uh, the, the sacrifice that was made, you know, and he, he wanted a lamb to be slain. And that was a picture of Jesus. As you go forward, you see the sacrifices throughout Levit uh, Leviticus and all. And the, the sacrifices are made. They all represent Jesus. And, and then you go into the prophets and the prophets are just full. I mean, how about Daniel? I mean, he's, he's just describing who, in fact, in fact, uh, Isaiah is like, unto us a child shall be born, <laughs> his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, unto you is born this day uh, in, this, in, in Bethlehem. I'm messing it all up. But you know, all these prophecies, Old Testament prophecies, talking about Jesus so clearly that when we get to the gospel, it's just like, oh, this was a fulfillment of this prophecy that Isaiah said. This was a fulfillment of this prophecy that you know was in the Psalms. By the way, elsewhere, whenever Jesus is talking about himself, uh, 
and he's going through the scriptures. It says, and the Psalms. I just kind of uh, I didn't write that, that passage down. So the Psalms are even listed in there as being something that, that spoke of Jesus Christ. And so all throughout the Bible, it was written for a purpose that people might see uh, Jesus Christ. Now, they didn't understand that throughout history, but after Christ came, it was like, this is the one that's been prophesied of. This is what the, this prophet was talking about and all that. So everything in the Bible was talking about uh, uh, Jesus coming. That's what it was all about. Now, real quickly, you're not going to believe this, but that was all introduction and I have five points. <laughs> but we're not going to, uh, it's not going to be like that. Okay, real quickly, I'm going to give you these five points and, uh, and we'll wrap it up. Okay, so what is, based on 2 Timothy 3, what is the profitability of all the Scripture? Because all the Scripture has profit, okay? It says, From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So number one, how is the Scripture profitable? Right away we see it'll bring you to salvation, right? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Like, we have to have the Word of God to understand who Jesus even is and what Jesus did. And once we know that the whole Bible is talking about Jesus and we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're saved, right? So the first thing is it brings us to uh, the saving knowledge of the Lord. And then he says, uh, all Scripture, this is verse 16, is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture, okay? All 66 books. I don't have time to delve into how we got the 66 books. Maybe I can do that one day. And it's profitable for, we already talked about salvation, but after salvation, it's profitable for doctrine. Okay, so number two, and I've heard some fancy, some kind of cute ways to remember, uh, you know, what, what this is talking about and what it's profitable for, but I'm just trying to be as, as, uh, as simplistic as I can. Okay, number one, salvation. Number two, it provides us with the proper doctrine. You know, all the theology, the bibliology, harmardiology, and soteriology, I mean, all these things that they study in Bible college, whatever, you know, here's how you get all the ologies. You pick up your Bible and you read it. And I'm not saying that, you know, these guys aren't, are, are wrong in like calling these certain names necessarily. I'm just saying like, it, it, don't worry about what the men are saying. The men are getting it from the Bible. You can get it from the Bible too. You know, other people can help you understand the Bible. That's why we have preachers and stuff like that. But you can read the Bible for yourself. The Bible says, uh, you know, that uh, we can we can learn that. The, the thing about the Bereans, you know, they are more noble than these and that they search the Scripture daily to see if these things were so. So you don't just receive that the Bible is truth, and you should be believe that, obviously. But then you go and you see, okay, let's see if this is right. This person talked about this doctrine over here. Well, hey, this person that's talking about this doctrine could be a creep that's crept in, and he's like Janus and Jamborees, you know, and he's and he's bringing all this fake doctrine. But you can go to the Bible and say, huh, let's see, what does the Bible say? No, no, the Bible doesn't say that, and you can withstand them. And even though they might not ever believe the truth because they're blinded or whatever, you could uh, you could know the truth because God's given us the Holy Scripture, all of it, and all of it is inspired. Number two, or that was number two. Number three, it points out our faults, okay? So he says all Scripture is, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof, okay? It's, it will reprove you. It will let you know as you're reading along, you're like, oh, man, that's talking about me. I need to live better. This way. I need to have more patience. I need to be more loving. I need to watch my tongue. I need to do all these things. And, and you're reading that, and it's, and it's, and it's reproving you. Okay, uh, and it's not just uh, just salvation. It's not just knowing the basic doctrine, but then it's, it changes our behavior. You know, I think about Hebrews chapter six, which says, you know, uh, you know, we need to leave these principal things, these simple doctrines or whatever. We need to go on and do those things which uh, uh, accompany salvation. That's in Hebrews chapter six, verse uh, verse nine. Okay, uh, then number four. It corrects our misunderstandings. I mean, that could be a fault as well and something that needs to be reproved. But for the most part, what I'm saying here is that just, you know, there are certain things that maybe we grew up this way. And so we just kind of understand something to work a certain way or, uh, you know, uh, 
It may be, maybe we misunderstood things about the Bible, even little doctrines and stuff. And this will help correct our understanding about uh, what is right in God's eyes. Okay, so it says for reproof and for correction. And, uh, and you know, just like uh, this uh, Janice and, and, and Jamboree's, right? They... They were uh, they were wrong in what they were doing. They were what they were presenting was fake, okay. But we can know that hey, that's that's wrong, and maybe I I'm doing wrong all this time. But but I have the ability to read this and to accept what's true. Look at Acts chapter seventeen. And I already uh, quoted this verse a minute ago, but look at it here. It says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness in my, uh, of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You know what happens? Sometimes we misunderstand how something works or, or some biblical principle. And then a preacher comes along and says, Hey, here's what the Bible says. You know, and they kind of reprove that, right? The Bible reproves it, I guess. And then it also corrects our misunderstanding. And, uh, and it tells us, hey, that's not, that's not right. What you've been believing is wrong. But here's what people do. Sometimes like Janice and Jambres, they'll see that, sna that, that serpent swallowing up the other serpents and they'll be like, hmm, you know what? I'm just going to still stand on my previous belief. Even though the Bible like showed them that they're wrong and, the, and, it, and it's like clearing up the misunderstanding, but they're like, no, I think I'm going to believe what I believe. And here's what people do. Sometimes they'll open up the Bible and instead of just saying, hey, what does the Bible say? They'll be like, let's see, what kind of loopholes can I find that'll make people believe that what I'm saying is true? And it's amazing how people will rest the scriptures like Peter said that they do with Paul's writings. And they'll 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 make those scriptures and they'll they'll just jump around and they'll have these charts and you got to go to this scripture then you got to go over here and if you read this word backwards and you count the numbers of these letters and uh, you know and then you go to the book of Genesis and you count those letters one two three I mean just a weird bizarre numerology and all these kinds of things and uh, and it's like why don't you just accept that the Bible says this and it's very very clear. <laughs> But they're like, the reason why is because, you know, well, my pastor, back whenever I was a kid, he taught me this and that. And so then they stand on that and that guy's not even alive anymore. I always wonder sometimes like some of these guys that were people to this day are standing really strong on these doctrines that somebody taught like a hundred years ago. And you just wonder like if that guy was alive now, he'd be like, that's not what I meant. <laughs> or he'd be like, I don't know what I was thinking. I was wrong. That's stupid. <laughs> you know, obviously he would now if they're in, if he's in heaven, he would have all of his doctrine right. Uh, but I always wonder like they're not even alive anymore. And these people are like trying to defend what those guys taught. And it's like, but that's not what the Bible says. Read the Bible for yourself and, and it'll clear up your misunderstandings. And finally, it says for instruction in righteousness, the Bible shows us how we're supposed to live. What is righteousness? What am I supposed to do? What's right and what's wrong? The Bible uh, shows that. And it says this, last, last place to look. <sighs> this is the conclusion. 2 Timothy 3. And here's what it says. <clears throat> All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now think about what he just said. He's like, God has provided you with something that if you read it and you apply it to your life, it's going to help you to be perfect. Not without sin. And we're not saying that. We're just saying he goes on to kind of define what, what he's meaning by perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, you're, you're, you're mature. You're furnished with what you need to, you, you've got a good handle of the Word of God. You understand these things. The Bible has given you that. But just even using that word perfect, the way we think about perfect, uh, and just thinking about, you know, truly furnished, I mean, completely furnished. Well, now think about this. If there's no such thing as a complete revelation of God, 
And believe it or not, there are a lot of people out there that think, well, I mean, yeah, I know that's what the Bible says, but really, is that like all the Word of God? I mean, maybe there's these hidden books out there that we haven't discovered yet. Or have you ever heard about, you know, this uh, lost book of, you know, Gospel of according to Thomas or the book of Enoch or, or what about, you know, look, the thing is, if we don't have a, a complete, perfect Word of God, how could we ever be perfectly, you know, uh, how could we ever be perfect and truly furnished, you know, and, and completely understand what is right and what's wrong? We would always feel like we're lacking somewhere. Like if there, if we just knew what the scripture meant about this, if we could just find that missing passage of scripture, you know, that's out there somewhere, then we could be truly furnished, right? No, we have everything we need. God provided everything we need in this book that's stood the test of time which over 1,400 years or 1,500 years, whatever it is, that's a long period of time, over 40 authors that didn't know each other, the majority of them, hardly any of them knew each other, and they're just writing as they're inspired by the Holy Ghost. And it not it just a coincidence that all of the books talk about Jesus and all of the visions are very similar, the visions of God and of angels, not exactly the same. It's not like they copied from each other, but they're close enough to let you know, hey, these guys are talking about the same thing. Isn't it just interesting that all these gospel writers, they didn't compare notes, right? But they all pretty much told the same accounts of all the things that happened and how Jesus talked about, hey, if you believe on me, you can have eternal life. And isn't just something that when we get to Revelation, it brings everything right back to the book of Genesis. One man didn't just sit down and design this and say, hey, I'm going to write this masterpiece. They'll be, they'll be selling this like just like crazy throughout all, uh, all eternity, right? No, this was just a collection of things that just, you know, and you could go to four different continents and you could find, you know, where this, where there are more manuscripts, you know, that match this. So nobody stood around and doctored this and changed it to something like, it's undeniable that this was a masterpiece that one person didn't just sit together and come up with, but it's a masterpiece that just coincidentally all matched up from all these authors over all these uh, thousands of years and, or, uh, you know, uh, I guess, I guess less than 2000 years, but all of these fit together like a glove. And when you read it from Genesis to Revelation, it's like, this is complete. This is everything we needed to know. It's just there. And there's really nothing else that it needs to tell us. Okay. Isn't it interesting that the Bible says, you know, that, uh, you know, the word of God, let me see here. Uh, let me put it this way. If we had the liberty to add to the Bible, okay, because it's not complete. It is complete, but I'm saying if we thought it wasn't complete and we had the liberty to, to, to add what we thought needed to be added to that, which is what a lot of modern translators do, actually. I mean, you know, that's debatable. You know, we can kind of read into this a little bit. We can add this. We can take away this. By the way, a lot of modern versions, like if you compare the two scriptures, there'll be entire verses or in some cases, almost entire chapters that are missing, not even there. Either somebody added or somebody took away, right? Well, if we had the liberty to just do that, you know, how could these verses in the Bible say, don't do that? Proverbs 30, verse 6 says, if you add or take away from the Bible, uh, you know, you're going to be cursed. Revelation 22, 18 says, don't add or take away or these plagues are going to come upon you. I'm paraphrasing these for the sake of time. But we don't have the, that liberty because we have the entire word of God and we have it is perfectly that's inspired of God. Is God breathed is another way of say that, and it is, it, and it's everything that we need down to a T. You know, I was talking to a guy the other day who's uh, very liberal. He, he's a Christian, proclaims proclaims to be a Christian, but he's very liberal. And uh, his idea of the Word of God is that, like, you know, it's very, very fluid. <laughs> like, you know, we can, we got a lot of liberties to do this or that. If you sit down and read this book from the front from the beginning to the end, you're like, there's not really a whole lot of liberty. I can't just make it say whatever I want to say. It's pretty clear what it's saying. And if we had the liberty to change it or whatever, uh, that, that would not make us somebody who could be perfect, truly furnished unto all good work, and, uh, and know that what we believe in is the absolute truth. 
But we don't have some obscure finding. We don't have like just, hey, what does it mean to you? Let's just sit down and have this class and, and uh, we'll all just sit around and tell you what the Bible means to, means to you. There's a lot of people that like to do that. But I'll close with this one passage. 2 Peter chapter 1. And if we don't have all Scripture and we can make it say whatever we want, then it's really not that profitable at all. But it is profitable because we don't have that liberty. 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's start in verse 19. We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For a prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And there's no doubt about that, that when we get to Revelation, it's done. There's no doubt about it that Paul says, hey, I'm the last apostle. There's no other apostle. So there's no other authority where somebody can say, hey, God spoke to me. And uh, just like he did the prophets in the Old Testament, he spoke to the apostles and I gave you the word of God. Nobody else can rise up, although there are people that try and say, hey, I'm an apostle. God gave me this revelation to give to everybody. Nope, that doesn't work that way. The Bible is complete. We have a sure word of prophecy. It's perfect. It's entire. It's whole. And everything we need is right there. And that's what makes it profitable for our salvation. We can be sure about our salvation because of the Scripture. We can know proper doctrine because of the Scripture. We can uh, you know, know what we're doing wrong in our lives because of the Scripture. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we don't want to take it for granted, take it lightly, that you have given us through history uh, this perfect word of God. Not only that, but you have uh, given, it into, given it to us in our language and uh, uh, translated it perfectly that we might have it entirely. And I pray that you would just help us to recognize that, to respect that, and to live by it and be like the Bereans and and uh, search the scriptures daily that we might see if these things are so. I pray that you guide us in that way and lead us to do better for you, to be perfect and truly furnished unto good works. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.